Okay, class, today we're going to go over section 2.1. Uh, what we're going to do in this section is we're going to be given data. Now, data, data are observations experiments or any type of data collecting that comes in the form of numbers or labels. So there's gonna be two types. We have qualitative and you have quantitative data. Now qualitative are labels such as, you know, genders, genders, ethnicity, uh, types of cars, anything, anything that has a label that's considered qualitative. Quantitative are numerical. Right. When we talk about uh, number of siblings you have, how much money you have, number of pets, all those are considered to be quantitative numbers. So we're going to look first at uh, quantitative data. So you're going to be given a list of data. And so when you're given data, and I'll give you an example, uh, the one in the book, in our ebook, has uh, data uh, pertaining to drive through service times uh, for McDonald's lunches. So we have a list of data here, and all those numbers represent the number of seconds that people had to wait after ordering their lunch through the drive-thru. So notice that the numbers here, they're out of order, right? There is no ordering scheme to it. It's not organized. So what we have to do is we'll have to get all those data values. I believe there's 50 of them. And we're going to get those 50 and we're going to organize them. So that's so one thing that we're going to do first is we're going to organize the data. So to organize it, there's a topic in the section that shows you how to organize it. So we must organize the data. Okay, so to organize it, we use what they call a frequency distribution table. So the definition of it, right, so we can go back to the book and the book gives a great definition of what a frequency distribution is. It's right here in the yellow. A frequency distribution table shows how data are partitioned partitioned
I'm just writing down the formula among several categories. And they are referred to as classes by listing the categories along with the number, the frequencies, they're called frequencies, the counts. of data, of data values in each of them. So that's the definition. So we're gonna go back to our data. So I'm gonna somehow get all those 50 numbers, right? And I'm gonna organize them and we're gonna create this, this table. Now the table is going to mimic kind of like when you all took college algebra or you're taking college algebra. It's kind of like a t-table, right? So you you recall on a t-table you were graphing I don't know lines or parabolas or um, graphs in general, right? You had you had a t-table, right? So our t-table kind of look like this. Well, you had your X and your Y, right? You have your X, your X, your values here, you have your Y columns here, but it's, it's gonna be kind of like it. But on the left column, you're gonna have your classes. We also refer to them as intervals. You have your classes and you have your frequencies. Frequencies go there, right? So what we do is we create these classes. Now, later on, I'll show you how to create these classes. But for now, we're just going to use what, uh, what's given. So they gave us intervals and the intervals ran. Let me see, how does the book have it? I believe it starts off as 75 to the 124. You have 125 through 174, 175 through 224, 225 through 274, and you have 275 through 324. So here are, here are our classes, right? We have our classes here. And what we're going to do is we're going to get each of those 50 numbers, 50 data, and we're going to put them in their correct spot that they belong to, right? So this, there's, there's five different intervals. So the first interval says, all, you want all the numbers that are between 75 and 124, and we're going to mark them off here. You're going to find all the numbers on the list that are between 125 and 174. You And the third one, you want all the numbers from 125 through 224 that go in between there, and so on and so on. Right? So we're going to go through and, and do that. But again, there's 50 of them, so it'll take a while for you to do it, but you can do it. So you would get, as an example, you would get this 107. So if you start off with 107, you would go and check, where does this 107 go? Which, which interval does 107 belong? So you would go ahead and put it in the first one, right there. So you put a little tally mark, like so. Then you go to the next one. The next one was 139. 139 belonged to this one. So you put a little, a little stick 
So for every number that's on that list, you would go ahead and find its correct interval and place a stick next to it and you would mark it off. And you would do it for all 50 of them. Now that's that's the long way of doing it. I mean, you can do it. It'll take a while, It'll probably take like five, six minutes to do, but there has to be an easier way of doing it. So 50 is doable. Suppose you had a hundred, a thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand, you had a million data. How would you go about doing it? Well, it would take a long time for you to do, so there has to be an easier way. So there is. So this is where this is where Excel will come into play. So what I did was I went ahead and copied the data and I put it on an Excel spreadsheet. Notice there are, and I, you have to put them, you have to put the data, you have to list the data in one complete column. Notice I put all the data in column A and I put one data value per cell, right? So it runs all the way, there's 50 of them. Right, so if I want Excel to do my counting for me, so that's what I want. I want someone to do the counting for me. I don't want to do the counting. Right? It's going to take a long while to do. So what you want to do first is you want to somehow put those numbers in order. So to do that, you're going to click on, you're going to click on, if you click on the A, it'll highlight the entire column. And on the top of your Excel spreadsheet, you have these tabs at the very top. You want to go ahead and make sure that it's clicked on home and you go as far right as you can. And there should be a button with a choice that has AZ with a little funnel. And then it says below it, sort and filter. You want to hit that button. So you click on that button and you want to go ahead and click on sort from smallest to largest. So once you do that, it'll put the values in order for you. So I'm going to click on it. So you see how it's 107? I'm going to click on it and bam, your data has been in place in order from smallest to largest. Right, you want to see that again? So you click on you click on the A, go to your home tab at the very top, make and you click on the A Z with the filter, click on sort from smallest to largest, and your data is listed in order for you. So I'm gonna let Excel count the data for me. So I'm gonna go back to my uh, my table that I wrote down in my notes. And what I wanna do is I'm gonna let Excel do my counting for me. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna highlight the, the ordered data and I wanna highlight the numbers that are between 75, between 75 and 124. I'm just gonna highlight them. So I'm gonna go back to my list in my Excel spreadsheet. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna highlight the values from 75 through 124. So, okay, so I wanna click on that hold. You're gonna click and hold, and I'm gonna go up to the, up to 124 or less. And I think it stops right there, bam. And I let go of my left clicker on my mouse. And if you look at the very bottom of the screen, the way at the bottom right, way at the bottom right, it's right underneath this little scroll bar at the very bottom. There is a count right on the bottom. And the count on the bottom says 11. As you can see it right there, I wish I had a little highlighter, but it's right there. It says 11. So it counted it. So there are 11 data values that are between 75 and 124. So the next interval says 125 through 174. So I'm gonna highlight all the numbers that are between 125 through 174. So I'm gonna click left, I'm gonna left click hold, and I'm gonna drag it down to up to 224 or smaller. The smaller value, 224. So it's a big 224. I believe it's gonna stop right there. I'm sorry, 125 to 124, 174, 125 to 174, I went too far, right there. Uh, I think 171 is as small as I can get to 174, so I'm gonna let go. And on my bottom of my screen, 
right underneath that little scroll bar here in the bottom, it says 24. It's very tiny. You have to really squint to find that number, All right? So I got the third, the third class. So I'm sorry, like second class. So the third class reads, I want numbers between 175 through 124. 175, I think it's right there at 184 through 224. 224. The smallest number is 208. So on the bottom of my screen, it reads 10. There are, are 10 numbers that are between 175 through 224. Now the fourth one. I want to highlight the numbers that are between 225 through 274. 225, that's the, that's the closest I can get through 274. Mm, there's only three. And finally, I want numbers between 275 through 304. There are two. And so here is your completed uh, frequency table. 11, 24, 10, 3, 2. You want to double check. We go back to page on our book. Uh, you can see that we match there's 11. There it is, 11, 24, 10, 3, 2. And so Excel does a marvelous job in doing the counting for us, right? Which is cool. That is so cool. So that's your frequency distribution uh, table. So what we're going to do now with our table is we're going to we're going to break the table up and, and describe some of the features of the table that we need to know. So let's look at our table. Here's our table. I'm going to break it down. I'm going to break this table down using the definitions and the terminology that the book uh, has. So here's our table. And if you go to our book, it has some definitions that we're going to go through based off of our table. So there are one, two, three, four, five. There's five of them. So we're going to go through what a lower class limit is. We're going to go through what an upper class limit is. I will skip past boundaries because those are the more difficult ones. So we'll skip that one. We'll leave that one last. So we'll do lower, upper class midpoints, and we'll talk about class widths. All right, so let's look at our first definition. Our first definition is called lower class limits. All right, so let me go back to my notes. So our lower class limits, uh, the definition says that they are the smallest numbers. The smallest numbers that can that can belong. to the different classes. Okay. So on our list, our lower class limit values are going to represent be represented by the left most values of each of your classes. Since I have five of them, these values on the left of each interval represent the lower class. So my lower class limits are 75, 125, comma, 175, 225, and 275. Those are the lower class limits. The next ones are the upper 
class limits. Okay. The upper class limits are the largest numbers that can belong to the different classes. That's the definition of upper class limits. So if the lower classes are the less, the uppers are going to be all of the right most values among your intervals. So this is this one will be your uppers. So my uppers are 124, 174, 254, 274, and 324. So there they are, 124, 174. I'm just writing them down. 224, 274, and 324. Those are my upper class limits. So left are lowers, right are the uppers. All right, next. Next definition. They are going to be the class width. All right, so class width. Remember, I'm going out of order. Sorry, class midpoints. Let's do class midpoints first, and then we'll do class width. Class midpoints are the values in the middle of each class. So you want to find you want to find the middle value in between each of these classes. You got to do it. You got to do it for each of these five classes. You got to find the midpoints for all the intervals of the classes that you have. You have to find the midpoints of each. You have to. Right? So how do I do it? So I can give you the formula. So what you're going to do for each for each class, you're going to do lower plus upper divided by two. Lower plus upper divided by two. So for example, let's do the first. So I'm gonna do 75 plus 124. So 75 plus 124. And then I'm going to divide by two. And then you do it for the next one. 125 plus 174. And then we're going to divide it by two. And you get to put parentheses. You have to put your parentheses on it, right? The next class had 175. And we're going to add that to my upper. 224 divided by two. Next Fourth uh, class is 225 plus 274, and I'm going to divide it by 2. And the last one's 275 plus 324, and I'm dividing it by 2. So you got to do it for each one, right? So I'm going to compute. I'm going to compute the first one. So I'm going to do 75, parentheses, 75 plus 124 divided by two. So you can see how I did in my calculator. I did 75 with parentheses, of course. 75 plus 24 divided by two gave me 99.5. So 99.5, 99.5. The next one's going to be 
uh, let's see, 125 plus 174 divided by 2, 149.5. Next one is going to be 199.5. Next one's going to be 249.5. And the last one's going to be 299.5. So you can you guys can double check for me. And those are correct. And so these are your these are your class midpoints. Later on, we will be using those to find a certain characteristic in our analysis of the data. So here are your class midpoints. So there's a formula. It is lower plus upper divided by two in parentheses. So those are your class midpoints. All right, next, next one is the class width. How do we find the class width? Okay, so for the class width, I'm gonna give you the definition first. All right, class width, is the difference between two consecutive two consecutive lower class limits. or two consecutive lower class boundaries. All right, so that's the definition of, of the textbook. So let me give you let me give you another definition of it, right? So you want to look at the increments. How, what are the increments among the lower class limits? Or you can do upper class limits. Or you can look at the class width, I'm oh, sorry, class boundary, uh, midpoints, class midpoints. Right. So if you look at the increments, how, how are the increments going? If you just simply look at the lower class limits or you look at the upper class limits or you look at the class midpoints, what are the increments? So let's go back and look at our lower class limits. What are the, what are the spaces in between each of these numbers in red. Well, if you notice, then go in in increments of 50. So if you do 50 plus 75, you get 125. Add another 50, so you get 125. So they're going in increments of 50 each time. Right? If you look at the upper class limits, these are also going by 50. They're going in increments of 50. And if you look at your class midpoints, look at the midpoints. These are also going by 50. So since there's consistency, that means our class width is 50. Okay. 
it's always going to be the same for all three comparisons, right? They're all going to be the same. If they're not, then there's something wrong. It's got to be consistent. So it's 50. The pass width is it's going to be represented by, by 50. All right, so that's your class width. And now the tough one. The tough one is going to be the class, the class uh, boundaries. So let's look at our class boundaries. Okay, so for the class boundaries, Let me give you first the definition of what a class boundary is, and then we'll show you how to do it. And there's two ways of doing it. I'll show you the long way first, and then I'll show you a shortcut. All right, so class boundaries. All right, so the definition of class boundaries are, they are the numbers, used to separate the classes, but without the gaps. Created by the Class limits. All right. So what are they? All right, class boundaries are going to represent, they represent the values of the labels of the horizontal scale for certain graphs. In particular, we're going to talk about um, histograms, histograms, histograms. They usually, histograms usually use uh, a scale. These tick marks on the bottom scale of the graph will be the uh, class boundaries. Yeah, these little tick marks there are going to represent your class boundaries. All right, so how do I do it? So how do I how do I construct uh, the class uh, boundaries? All right, so there's a formula for it. <clears throat> so the formula or the steps, there's steps. So there's steps. Okay, so the steps are number one. I mean, we'll, we'll test it out in a minute. Okay, so step one. You're going to choose, choose a or an upper class limit. You can choose any of your choice. All right, so let's go back to my table, uh, my chart. Where's my where is my table? Table is right here. There's my table. So you choose any, you can choose any, any of these numbers. You can choose any of them. I'm going to choose 174. So I'm choosing, I'm choosing 174. I'll make that blue. I'm choosing 174. You can choose, you can choose 224. It don't matter. 
I'm going to choose 174. Next step, you're going to subtract that value. Subtract that value from the next lower class limit. So the next lower class limit after 174 directly is going to be 175. So I'm going to do 175. And I'm going to subtract 174. They're always going to be opposite from each other. They're going to be diagonal from each other, always. Even if you have chosen 224, you can see that it's going to be directly diagonal. Right? And you subtract. So we get we get one, right? So that result divide 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 the result by two. So I'm going to get my one, and I'm going to divide by two. And I get 0 0.5. Put it in a box. Right. So what you do with that result, you're going to get this number, that 0 0.5. And what you're going to do is you're going to add it, 0 0.5, you're going to add it to all the upper class limits. And you're also going to get the 0 0.5, and you're going to subtract it to all of the lower class limits. So you're going to add that result to all upper class limits. And subtract that result to all of the lower class limits. So you add and you're going to subtract 0 0.5. So on my on my table, my table I'm going to show you. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to be adding add 0 0.5 to all of these numbers. And you're going to subtract 0 0.5 to all of these numbers. That's what you're doing. You're going to be adding and subtracting. So I'm going to do, if I do the lower classes first, I'm going to get, I'm going to get 75, 75 minus 0 0.5. I'm going to get 125 minus 0 0.5. I'm going to get 175 minus 0 0.5. 225 minus 0 0.5 and 275 minus 0 0.5. And for the uppers, I'm going to add. I'm going to get this 124. Add 0 0.5. 174. Add 0 0.5. 224. Add 0 0.5. 274. Add 0 0.5. And 324. I'm going to add 0 0.5. And you're going to get a list of data. You're going to get a list of numbers when you do your add and subtract. All right, so I'm going to do this. I'm going to start adding them or subtracting these sides. So this is, I'm going to get, I'm going to get, um, I'm going to get 74.5. I'm going to get 124.5. I'm going to get 174.5. I'm going to get 224. 
five, and I'm going to get two seventy four point five. And I'm going to add over here. That's one twenty five point five. Okay, I think I, I get this one wrong. Sorry, this should have been one twenty four. One twenty four. So that should be 124.5. The next one to 174.5. Yeah, that should have been a 124. These are your upwards. Uh, this one is going to be 224.5, 274.5, and 324.5. Right. So notice, notice among the blue, I have numbers that are duplicates. Uh, this and this is a duplicate. That one and this one are duplicates. This and this are duplicates. So you have you have numbers that are similar. So what you're going to do is you're going to condense you're going to condense the list, and if a value appears, you know, again, just write it once. So we're going to compile our list, and we're going to write each of our values that we have on our list. We're going to write them once. So you don't want to write the duplicates. You're just going to write each of them that values once. So I'm going to write that one time because that appears one time, right? I'm going to write this number once because they're, the, they're the same. You're going to write each number once. And those the list of those numbers are going to constitute your pass boundaries. So here we go. Let's write down my list. So my class boundaries. Are going to be 74.5. That one. Next one is 124.5. All right, I got those two. They're the same. Next one is 174.5. That next one is uh, 224.5. That one. 274.5, I got that one. And my last one is 324.5. And there are your class boundaries. So there is another way you could do it, which may be easier. Notice that you have duplicates that appear, right? And since we're writing them once, that's that's what happens. So the shortcut, if you want to do a shortcut in finding the class boundaries, you still have to go through the first three steps. Step one, find an upper class limit. Step two, sub, you know, subtract the sum to the next upper class limit, a lower class limit, divide by two, right? You get this 0 0.5, and this is what you do, folks. You do a shortcut. You're going to get the 0 0.5, and you're going to subtract it from the very first value, very first lower class value, which was 75. So if I do 75 minus my 0 0.5, notice that I'll get, I'll get 74.5. Right? You're going to get this. You start at the this is the beginning, right? Beginning, right? You get 74.5. And now you can use the fact that our width was 50. So if you add 50 to our width, from our width, you get that. You add another 50. You get that. You get another 50. You add another 50. You add another 50. You get the other one. So how do you know when to stop? Well, you stop. You should have the number, your... The number of classes that you have uh, will determine how many class boundaries you have. It's always one more. Your class boundaries are one more than the number of classes that you have. So number of classes that we had, there were there were five of them. One, two, three, four, there's five of them. So when you compute your class boundaries, you should have six. It's always one more. 
one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. So if you if you if you had seven classes, your class boundaries are going to have eight. So your class boundaries have one more value more than the number of classes that you have. So you always start start with the very beginning of your lower your lower class limit. You always start with your lower class limit and you subtract zero point five. And that's that'll be the start down class boundary. And then you start adding your class widths. You end up with the same numbers. That's the shortcut. Or you guys can do the same thing. You can just go ahead and get your 0.5, subtract it to all your lowers, add it to all the uppers, you compile your list, you get your you get your class boundaries. All right, so those are your class boundaries. All right. And now I'm going to show you all uh, some graphs. Okay. So graphically, when you're graphing, when you're graphing uh, quantitative data, and you're dealing with frequency distribution tables, you'll encounter graphs. So you'll be have to be able to distinguish whether or not what kind of graph or what kind of distribution your data is forming. So there are three different types of graphs. One of them is this shape. This shape is called a Bell distribution, also referred to as a normal distribution. They also refer to as a bell shape. I should put bell shape. It's bell shape. So it is unique because there's a term called symmetric. Right? Symmetric means it's equal. This side's the same as the other side. So that's where the symmetric comes into play. Some people think it's like a parabola. Yeah, it's kind of like a parabola. It is symmetrical. There's your axis of symmetry. It is symmetrical. So whatever this side is, it has to be the same on the other side. That's what symmetric means. So if, you, if your table is symmetrical, then it is bell-shaped. So let me show you an example of what to look for to see if your frequency distribution table is bell shaped. So let's say that you have you have your classes, right? It don't matter what what those intervals are. You're just look, you're just looking at the frequencies, right? You're looking at the frequencies to see if it's bell shaped. So you will encounter a bell shape if your frequencies look like this. Right. This is an example of a frequency distribution table that is bell-shaped. Notice it is symmetrical. The ends are the same. These are the same. These are the same. It peaks in the middle. You have to look at it from sideways. You can see that it is symmetric. That's This table would constitute a bell-shaped curve or normal distribution. So it's gotta be, it's gotta be symmetrical. Symmetrical. All right. Next graph. It'll be a graph where the high point is at the very beginning and then it tapers off at the very end. This one is called skewed right. Why is it skewed right? because of the tail, the tail end of it makes it skewed right. You have to look at the tail. The tail determines how skewed it's going to be. So this is a skewed right graph. So what would a frequency table look like? All right, so let's look at a example of what a frequency table will look like. Again, ignore the classes. We're just looking at the frequencies. 
and it would go something like 6, 12, 8, 5, 3, 2, 1, something like that, right? So notice the peak occurs at the beginning and then it tapers down to form your tail. This is a skewed right distribution. We can, we can turn it sideways. Six, so see there's a hump. The hump is right there. Then you got the third one. The third one is called skewed last. So let's see if I can draw it. So the tail end is at the beginning, it goes up and then it goes down. That is a skewed left. Again, the tail, the tail determines how skewed the skew is going to go, the tail, skewed left. So a graph, the table, if you had a table, how do you know the table is considered to be skewed left? Again, ignore the classes, so you're just looking at the frequencies. They would go something like two, one, two, four, eight, 15, and then back to seven. Right? This one is skew left. The tails, it tapers off and rises, and then it peaks, and then it goes back down. And look, at, look at it sideways. One, four. This is skewed. All right, so there's an exercise in the book. Uh, be sure to go through those. I think it's nine. Uh, and try them all. Do, do uh, see if you can look at the tables from five, six, seven, and eight and determine whether they're skewed or belching. All right, so the next part that I'm going to go through is we're going to go back to our table or a distribution table that we had with the with the McDonald's uh, data. We had our table. I'm gonna have to put, I'm gonna have to recreate my uh, my table again. Right, not put that up. So let me let me copy my table back up. So my table had my classes. I had my classes. frequencies and my classes were 75 through 124, 125 through 174, 175 through 224. I had 225 through 274 and I had 275 through 324. And my frequencies were 11, 24, 10, 3, and 2. Okay. And so what we can do now that you guys know how what this graph represents, notice that this one is skewed right. There's the peak and it tapers off. Right, that's a skewed right. So what we can do is we can add on to our table and we can make extra stuff for later graphs. So we can go through and I can show you all how to create what we call relative frequencies. Relative frequencies. Okay, so what are relative frequencies? So pretty much what we're doing with relative frequencies is we're going to convert these frequencies into per, uh, decimals and then you can change them to percentages. Why do we need to do that? Well, in case we need to draw what we call pie charts, we can, we can create a graph of, among those relative frequencies. So to create relative frequencies, uh, we are going to, we have to add first. We have to add, we have to find the total of all the frequencies. So you're gonna add first 
all the number of frequencies. And I believe that there are 50 of them. Let's double check. Let's add them up. So 11 plus 24 plus 10 plus 3 plus 2. I got 50. All right, so you're going to get the total, right? And what you do is for each of these frequencies, you are going to divide by 50. You're going to divide each of them by 50. close and then we multiply by a hundred percent and the beauty of these is that when you round you get to choose where you want to round your values now the thing is whatever way you choose to round the first one has to be the same how you round the other ones so if you decide oh you know what i'm going to round this one to the nearest whole number then you got to do it the same with the other ones if you want to round the first one by the tenths then you got to round the other ones to the tenths it's got to be consistent okay so let me let me go ahead and do that so i'm going to do 11 divided by 50 and then i'm going to multiply by 100 i'm going to stick the you don't, have, you don't have to do the percentage in your calculator because there is no percentage in your calculator. You're just going to stick the percent symbol after. So you're going to do 11 divided by 50 times 100. Like that. 11 divided by 50 times 100. I get 22. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick the percentage after it. Right. Then I do the next one. 24. 24 divided by 50 times 100, I get 48. And I'm going to stick the percentage. Next one, 10 divided by 50 times 100 is 20%. Stick to percent. 3 divided by 50 times 100. 6%. And the last one is, what is the last one? 2. All right, so 2 divided by 50 times 100 gives me 4%. Now, notice all of these came out whole, so I didn't have to worry. But again, if you end up getting decimals, make sure that you round correctly. And if you decide to round to the tens, make sure that everything's round to the tens or hundreds, wherever you want. You decide how you want to round. So that's what relative frequencies are. You're converting the frequencies into percentages. Okay. All right. And the last, the last thing we can do also is we can create a, another column to create what they call cumulative frequencies, right? Now, cumulative, it's kind of like accumulation. If you grew up uh, in a city that had a lot of snow and it snowed a lot and snow accumulates, well, accumulation means that the snow is building, it's building up. So, to create, we're gonna, that's what's happening with cumulative. These values are accumulating as you go down. So to create the cumulative frequencies for this table, this is what you do, right? So you start, you start by writing down the very first frequency. You just write it down, just transpose it over. And then the next one, you start adding the next frequency to it, to it. So you're going to, I'm going to do it the long way, so you don't have to do that, but I'm just showing you how, how it works. So you're going to add 11 plus 24. And then on the next row, you're going to, you're going to start accumulating. So notice, I'm going to do 11 plus 24 plus 10. And then the next row is going to be 11 plus 24 
plus 10 plus 3. I keep adding the next value on that column as I go further and further. Right? I didn't compute it yet, but I'm going to go ahead and compute them. So that's 11. That's done. This is going to be 35. Next one's going to be 45. Next one's going to be 48. That should have been a 2. 48. And you end up with 50. So the very last number should match the total of your frequency. So notice cumulative you're adding as you go down the list. So you all can do a shortcut. You can do 11, start with 11, of course, then add 11 plus 24. 35, 35 plus 10, 45, 45 plus 3, 48, 48 plus 2 gives you 50. So these represent your cumulative frequencies. So now you are able to do the exercises in the textbook. So let me show you all a little warning uh, about the exercises in the book. All right, so let's see. I think I went too far out. Oh, yeah, here are the exercises. OK, now let me warn you about the exercises in the book. The author is very, very creative. So you want to make sure that you read the questions first, and they come before the problem. So they're gonna he's gonna stack on the problems as they are. But make sure that you read the exercises carefully so you can understand what he's asking for. So notice for problems five through eight, you are asked to find from these tables, you want to find the class width, right? Class width. You want to find the class midpoints and the class boundaries. And you also want to figure out what the number, the total, you want to identify the total number of individuals in the summary. So they're asking you, what is the grand total of the frequency? So you got to find one, two, three, and then the total for those exercises. Okay. For Columns 9 and 10, what you're going to do is you're going to look at the frequency tables and you're going to determine whether or not they're considered to be bell shape, normal, normal distribution, or are they skewed? I think you only have to do one. You have to do number nine. You have to look at problem number five and determine whether or not it is a normal distribution, skew left, or skew right. And then number, the ones after that are going to require you to create a frequency distribution table with the given information. So we can do, we can do number 11 as an example. All right, so let's do, let's do number 11. So number 11 says, create a frequency distribution on the data that's given. This is the old faithful geyser, uh, old faithful geyser at the Yellowstone National Park. So notice on this problem, it says, use these times to construct a frequency distribution. Use a class width of 25 and begin with a lower class of 125. All right, so I'm gonna write that down. So we're doing number 11. We're doing number 11. And I'm writing down what it's telling me. So it says here that I'm going to use a class. This is number 11 in section 2.1. I don't know what page it's, it's on on your e-text, but it's on 2.1, number 11. And it's, I'm going to write down, this is a class width is equal to 25 seconds. And the lower class limit, oh, begin, begin at 125. Okay, and I think the data are in order from 125 to 264, interesting. All right, so we don't have to put those in order, but if you need, if you want to, you can, 
you have two things you can do. You, and you can do this in the homework or not. So either you all type the data in as they appear on there, or you all can utilize the data that's provided for you on StatDisk. So if you want to, I'm going to use the one on StatDisk. So um, I'm going to show you how, you how to utilize the ones on StatDisk. Now, the ones on StatDisk, there's going to be more values than what appears on the exercises. So let's see if I can find it. Where is my stat disk? Let me share it. All right. All right. So you would go, you would go to data sets. You're going to use six edition. And you're going to go down to where it says old spaces. And we want the duration. So on the book, I think there's 50, but on stat disk, there are 250. So again, you can use the data that's on the book. You can type them in, or you can use the data that's on status. It doesn't matter. You decide how you want to do it. Uh, if you want to put if you want to put the durations in 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 order on status, here's how you do it. So you would go right here where it says uh, data tools, and you want to sort the data. You can choose the column that you want to put in order. So I'm going to select one column and I'm going to select the duration. And I'm going to put it from A to Z, from smallest to largest. I'm going to click on it, A to Z, and I hit sort. And bam, the data has been in order. It put in order for me from smallest to largest, right? You can download it to Excel and then do your, your count, right? So you can, we can do what we learned earlier, but I want to create my, I want to create my table. I want to create my intervals. I need, I need to know what my intervals are, right? So how do I do it? Okay. So on my intervals, I'm going to create the classes from scratch. So here's how we do it. Okay. You already know how to do the frequencies. Right, so let's go back at the very beginning of the, of the lecture. You can see how we got the frequencies. But I want to get my classes. So on the problem, it told me I need to start at 125. So they're telling me the very first beginning class. My lower, my lower class. It starts at 125. And then I got to find the other ones. But I know that my class width is 25. So what I can do is I can figure out what the other lower class limits are by simply adding the class width to the first one. So this, if I add 25, I get 150. Add another 25. 175, add another one, one, that should be 200. I jump the gun, that's 200, 225, 250, 275. I don't remember how far it went. I'm gonna do one more. I'm gonna do 300. Let's see how far it went on my uh, data in the book. So in the book, how far did it go up? It went up to 264. Oh, okay. So it went up to 264. So that means that means that uh, I can I don't have to go 264. I can just stop here. There. Right. Right. Now I gotta figure out what my upper class limits are. So to figure out the upper class limits, if you look at the you have your first lower class limit and then you have your second lower class limit. The upper is going to be one less than the pre the the next lower class limit. So this would be 149. And then this one would be one less than that one, which would be 174. This one was going to be 199, right across, right across would be 224, right across would be two. 49, and I believe this one would be 
279. Yeah. Then you would go back and start putting the little sticks in, or you put you put the you type in your data, right? Type in your data into Excel. They're in order, and then let Excel count, and you start putting your frequency count on my table, right there. All right, good luck on your homework.